I'm Christine. Welcome to another Harry Potter book talk. Today we are discussing Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. So if you don't know, this is book two in J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series. Harry Potter is magnificent. If you have not read the series yet, you should. If you haven't heard yet, I've been rereading via audiobook. I'm an Audible affiliate, so if you're interested in rereading via audiobook, if you use my affiliate link below, you get your first book for free. I just recently rewatched the Chamber of Secrets movie over a Christmas break with my brother, and I feel like that film was so close to this book. I was really expecting to be surprised by more things that went down. And maybe it's also because I used to play the Chamber of Secrets video game on PlayStation. Did anyone have that? It was so freaking hard. Things I remember from that game. Flipendo! Flipendo! A million times saying Flipendo. I remember being in Nocturne Alley and I remember never being able to get past the goddamn Whomping Willow level. <sighs> we never got past it. Freaking Whomping Willow! Book two, just like every other book, has an amazing cover. I love how the Harry Potter is in material metallic silver. Oh, on the back there's praise for the New York Times bestseller Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone from USA Today. You don't have to be a wizard or a kid to appreciate the spell cast by Harry Potter. True. Too true. Harry is destined for greatness, says the New York Times. They know their shit. My mom let my brother use my Harry Potter books for school when they had deer time. And she went ahead and wrote his name in every single one of my books. P. Riccio. No. C. Riccio. Oh, also, I forgot, the illustrated edition of Chamber of Secrets is coming out this year in September, I think. That's exciting stuff. First American edition, June 1999. That's about it for the non-spoiler section. Goodbye, people who don't want to be spoiled. Okay, so Chamber of Secrets is the first time we go to the burrow. We get to have a little more fun at the burrow in the book than we do in the film. I remember specifically in the video game, there was this whole denoming the garden section, where you like pick up the gnomes and spin around in circles and chuck them. So we get to do that in the book. It's Harry's first time being in a wizard's home, and it's such a magical experience for him. And Harry and the Weasley kid, they play Quidditch. Harry has his Nimbus 2000, and the Weasleys all have old, hand-me-down, clean sweeps. They couldn't use real Quidditch balls, and instead they threw apples for one another to catch. They took turns riding Harry's Nimbus 2000, which was easily the best broom. Ron's old shooting star was often outstripped by passing butterflies. <laughs> an hour and a pack of butterflies flying by. And something that we get in the book that we don't get in the movie is this extensive scene in Nocturne Alley where Harry ends up when he fails at flu powdering. Diagonally! Draco and Lucius come in and Lucius is selling a bunch of the dark shit that he has in his house because the ministry has been trying to raid his house for items of dark magic. And while we're there we see the opal necklace from book six. We see the hand of glory. Draco asks his daddy to buy him the hand of glory. Okay? And that is the the same hand of glory that we see in book six that he uses to guide the Death Eaters out of the room of requirement in the dark to attack Hogwarts. And we see the vanishing cabinet that he will use in the future to transport said Death Eaters into Hogwarts. Set up for shadowing beasts. JK Rowling is. Let's talk about the missing the train incident we see happening in Chamber of Secrets. So Dobby trying to save Harry's life. He doesn't want him to go back to school because he knows about Lucius's plot to drop the diary, to bring back Voldemort. They can't get through the barrier to go to school, but Ron's parents are right on the other side. They're like, literally, they're not alone. Their parents will come back for them if they didn't see them get on the train. They're your parents. They're looking for you. Harry's like, oh, I guess we should go wait by the car. And Ron's like, Harry, we can take why? Why is taking the car your answer to this problem? He's never driven the car himself. I don't know, where are you gonna park the car at Hogwarts? Like, do they have a parking lot? Your parents are gonna kill you because you're not even supposed to have a flying car. What a stupid idea! In what universe is this the best course of action? As soon as they get to school, McGonagall's like, why didn't you send us an owl? Don't you have an owl? And Harry's like, oh yeah. I guess we could have done that. The most logical course of action is to wait for your frickin' parents to come back. They weren't gonna leave the car. They weren't gonna leave the car and just disapparate home. So Ron's wand breaks in this book and it ends up 
setting so many things into motion. It's the reason Harry and Ron were able to rescue Ginny from the Chamber of Secrets. Because Gilderoy uses it and it backfires and erases his memory. But long term, it teaches us about wands. If Ron's wand never broke and we never had year two seeing him fuck up everything he ever tries to do with it, we wouldn't be as understanding of a broken wand when Harry breaks it in book seven. Watching Ron struggle with the wand throughout the year, it, it hurt if he told his parents that his wand was backfiring on him all the time was a danger to him and everyone around him. I think they would have found a way to get you a new wand. Or even the teachers. You would think the teachers would step in because this kid's wand is a pearl. If I was McGonagall, I would have called him into my office and been like, Wizzit, you cannot use that wand. You need a new wand. I'm going to notify your parents. And if his parents couldn't afford it, Dumbledore should have stepped in and bought one for him. He needs a wand. This is the book where the infamous eight slugs spell happens. Of course, it backfires onto Ron. I'm listening to this scene. When Ron says eight slugs, a jet of green light comes out of the back end of his wand and hits Ron in the chest. And I freeze like a jet of green light? Why is it green, Joe? We know that Avada Kedavra is a jet of green light. Maybe there are a lot of spells with jets of green light, but we don't hear about a lot of green light spells. So reading this was like a panic trigger. Boys and girls, when you're dueling and you see a jet of green light fly at you, it might be a killing spell. Or it might just be eight slugs, so get a 50-50 shot. I remember in the movies thinking that Gilderoy Locker wasn't attractive enough and wasn't annoying enough. He is way more annoying and attractive in the book. But movie Gilderoy was great. You know what would have been funny? If Robert Pattinson played Gilderoy Lockhart. That's hilarious. I love that. If we're going to do this again, Robert Pattinson for Gilderoy, please. I forgot that more people were petrified in the book. Justin Fletcher. Justin Filch Flap 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 Flap. You know who I'm talking about. He's the kid who's at the dueling club and the snake is going after him and Harry's like, hush up, hush, hush up. Justin thinks Harry's out to get him and he spreads the word throughout the school that Harry's the heir of Slytherin and no one wants to talk to Harry and Justin ends up getting petrified. That shit looks bad. It don't, it don't look good. And in the movie, that doesn't happen. So when it happened in the book, I was like, oh! I actually gasped upon rereading it because I had completely forgotten. There's a couple months where everyone's super afraid of Harry and Fred and George walk around with him being like, hey, out of the way, air slithering coming through. Give us a path, okay? Oh my God. Oh my God. I forgot about the Polyjuice Potion. Book two is when we learn all about Polyjuice Potion, which comes into play about a gazillion more times in the last few books. Why do these second years create this Polyjuice Potion? They think that Malfoy is the heir of Slytherin and they need to gather proof. They want to get into the Slytherin common room and just see what he's saying to grab a goyle because he must brag about it all the time in there. Okay, the only way that they could think of is to brew a month long potion where they have to steal from Snape's reserves and that they have to brew in a public bathroom. Like a girl's bathroom that no one goes to, but still a public bathroom. These 12 year olds. And then they have to knock out two other 12 year olds, steal their hairs, put their hairs in a drink and turn into them just to get into the Slytherin common room. Meanwhile, Harry's got an invisibility cloak chilling upstairs. An invisibility cloak would have made it so hard to put on the invisibility cloak and follow a Slytherin into the common room and then follow somebody out with their invisibility cloak. We have an invisibility cloak and they're so little they can all fit under it if they wanted to. It's just absolutely ridiculous but this is a very important learning experience for all of us because book four and book six and book seven we learn all about mandrakes in this book that you forget. The mandrakes are what bring back the petrified people to full health. The more I learned about them in this book, the more uncomfortable I was with us chopping them up, stewing them, and using them as medicine. The first time we see them, they're weird plant babies. You lift up the plant and there's like a weird dart baby underneath it, okay? We put it back down. They have to mature. And every once in a while, J.K. Rowling will update us on how the mandrakes are maturing. There's one part where they're all in their awkward pre teen phase, they got acne, it's a mess. I'm listening like, 
acne. What do you mean they have acne? Are they humans? Like, are these the plant versions of humans? And she follows up that sentence about them having acne, saying, pretty soon they'll be ready to be chopped up into little pieces for us to use. And I'm like, oh, it sounds like you're gonna be chopping up children. And then there's a part where we hear that the mandrakes threw a party in the greenhouse the other night. They threw a party and they went into each other's pots. And Professor Sprout goes, you know they're fully mature when they're trying to get into each other's pots. <laughs> what? Oh my god! They're in college and it's time. It's time to eat them now. This is weird. It's a weird. If they're capable of throwing parties. This is, these are things. These are things of brains. I also relearned a bunch of things about basilisks that I never really thought about until now. Okay, spiders fear the basilisk. I don't know why, because I don't think the basilisk likes to attack spiders. But whatever, okay. A basilisk, this giant snake that can literally kill you by looking at you, is afraid of a rooster's crow. That's something that I just completely forgot. In the book, Ginny murders a bunch of roosters because the basilisk is afraid of them. It's his weakness. A rooster crowing in the distance. No, don't crow at me. And we hear how a basilisk comes to be. It comes from the egg of a chicken hatched under a toad. So if you take a chicken egg and then you have a toad sit on it. It hatches into a basilisk. Some weird shit in this book. And the last thing I forgot about is when Harry and Ron are called to Dumbledore's office after escaping the chamber with Ginny and Gilderoy. Dumbledore awards them 200 points each. 200 points a piece. In perspective, last year we got 50 points a piece, right? For getting the Sorcerer's Stone. But we'd get a bunch of questions right, and we'd get five points for Gryffindor. When they broke the rules and tried to take on a troll, they got 10 points taken from Gryffindor. How do we scale this out? They just got 400 points for Gryffindor. And apparently you get points for Gryffindor when you win a Quidditch match. You get like 50 points for Gryffindor. The system is off the wall. Look at this book naked. Oh, I, you know what? I never really looked at Harry Potter books naked. That I've always kept the covers on. Dang! That's pretty. This looks like the UK version. This is a very enjoyable reread. I'd love to hear your thoughts on anything I've talked about or anything I didn't that you'd like to talk about. My name is Christine. I'm at XTeenMay on Twitter. I make videos every Tuesday. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you next time. Goodbye!